One of the great joys of EASD are the named lectures. They're usually absolutely dazzling and people flock to them. So I'm very pleased to have with me one of those uh, people giving the named lectures this year in this uh, uh, respect, the Camilla Golgi Prize, and it's Riaz Malik. Welcome. Thank you. What were you talking about? Uh, what uh, are the things that uh, you most wanted to say? Because often these events are actually a platform for a particular point of view. So I had to summarize uh, in 45 minutes about 34, 35 years of work. So no but, pressure. Yeah. But the main focus was diabetic neuropathy, which uh, has been coined the Cinderella complication. And the main points that I wanted to make were that when it comes to the complications of diabetes, diabetic neuropathy is way behind retinopathy and nephropathy for two reasons. One is late diagnosis. So unlike diabetic retinopathy where every high street opticians has got retinal scans or, or phot fundus photography, and when you go to your GP for nephropathy, they will do microalbuminuria. Neuropathy is a bit of a forgotten complication in that most GPs will just uh, say it's sufficient to do a clinical neurological exam. And the key difference is that when you do that, you only detect disease late. So it's advanced. And we know that if you detect disease late, neuropathy late, the consequences are dire because people have foot ulcers, they get pain, they have amputation. And in fact, the mortality, the five-year mortality for somebody with a foot ulcer is worse than most cancers. So I think we're not doing, actually we're doing a terrible job in terms of detecting the disease or neuropathy early. Um, so and that, of course it's enormously costly. Yeah, and, and actually if you look at every economic analysis that's been done, the biggest cost is not actually people, although it's emotive, going blind or getting renal failure. It's actually people who are developing foot ulcers who are then in hospital for weeks and weeks to try to heal that foot ulcer. And even beyond that, when the people have, you know, patients have amputations, then the rehabilitation costs a huge amount. So to me, a key part of trying to deal with the consequences is make the diagnosis earlier and actually do something about it to prevent it from getting to that stage. Um, so then uh, the major other thrust of the work that I presented was relation to a technique, which is an, actually an ophthalmic technique called corneal confocal microscopy, um, which allows us to image nerves live in people, in patients, within five minutes. And would and we have shown, and others have shown over the last 20 years, that it allows us to diagnose neuropathy very early, um, as in even in people with impaired glucose tolerance, in children with type 1 diabetes, and certainly in adults with diabetic neuropathy or, or asymptomatic neuropathy. When would you introduce uh, a technique like that? At what stage of, their, uh, of a patient's journey? Yeah, so to me, uh, it would be right at diagnosis because we, there are data to show that um, type 1 diabetes, certainly at diagnosis, there, there are changes that we can detect that the other tests can't detect. That's, that's the key issue that, you know, a neurological exam and monofilament, 20 years down the line, you get uh, changes and that's too late. Um, so, you, you, you know, you're, you're hiding to nothing but if, when you diagnose it and people do it because it ticks a box. It's an exercise, but it's not actually meaningful. Um, so yeah, so, so I, I talked about corneal confocal microscopy, how it's evolved as a technique from actually one man and his band to now uh, over 60 centers across the world, kind of in, in terms of research using this technique. Um, and it's gonna grow. And I honestly believe that it has to grow alongside, uh, much like retinal fundus photography, which is on every high street, um, we, we should be able to do, deliver this. And then we'll be at a stage where you can mass assess, mass screen people. Um, and beyond that, we also show that this, that this technique is, is not just for diabetic neuropathy, but actually is for a number of neurodegenerative conditions. Um, so virtually every neuropathy you can think of, 
um, whether it's chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, HIV neuropathy, uh, inherited neuropathies, we can detect changes using corneal compocal microscopy. And probably most importantly, in the last five years I've been in Qatar, uh, which is where we've really extended the use of the technique, where actually we now show that you can use corneal confocal microscopy to detect changes in people with Parkinson's disease, with multiple sclerosis, and dementia. Um, and I think that's really the, the other big direction that our work has taken. As you say, the really interesting thing to, is to get it out to a, to a mass audience, because one of the big trends that we're seeing in healthcare is the lack of health professionals. I mean, every country in the world does not have enough healthcare professionals. Yeah to satisfy the increasing demand for healthcare. So whatever we develop in diabetes has to be available and for use you know, on the high street. Yeah. But I guess there's still quite a resistance to that. There is, and that's just kind of like, I don't know, what can I say? It's the old guard that, that think that everything should be done through the doctor. Um, I think there's much to be said about technology, how it can be utilized, harnessed, and certainly, for example, you know, uh, we were talking earlier about retinal fundus photography and AI. Well, you know, similarly, corneal confocal microscopy, actually, it can be done by any good, well-trained technician. Um, the images are there. You can employ AI to actually identify the disease. Um, so, to me, it is harnessing that technology that's going to be the important thing to be able to use it more widely. These lectures are recognition of professional uh, achievement. As you look back at your stellar career uh, in diabetology, what has been the highlight for you? What have you been most proud of? Um, well, uh, actually, stellar careers aren't built on, on single people. It's always teams. It's always people, there's always fellows who work with you and your mentors. And I think that's the key. You know, I've been lucky, honestly, to have some fantastic mentors um, who've encouraged me uh, when I've had my deepest moments, when I've had doubts about what we're doing. You know, you kind of, they, they can help you to carry on. And honestly, what I do, clinical research, I think the most important thing is the patients, the, the sacrifices that they make to help us to do uh, deliver or, or, or discover um, can't be done without the patient's buy-in. And, you know, from, for so many of the studies we did, it required the patients to come back every six months, every 12 months, um, have extensive testing. And, you know, they don't need to do it. Um, they've got enough on their plate, actually, with diabetes um, to be kind of, OK, I've seen you once a year, thank you very much. But, you know, they did it, and, and, and that helped a lot. And actually, I, I don't think perhaps... Doctors and researchers have realized that citizen science is a movement that's really growing and that there are an army of people out there with diabetes, all now with, with very accurate devices yeah. that, that they've got, that want to be part of a research effort. Yeah. Yes, and actually they are, are driving, if you think about CGMS technology, you know, um, many or even pump technology many of the innovations were not driven by necessarily industry actually industry was pushed almost because i don't know how industry perceived it 10 years ago it's changed now but it was it was actually parents of of children um uh, bloggers you know people who are kind of uh, really into it who, who really tr harnessed the whole it side of um uh, this technology and and take it to the next level. So you look forward to the future and think that actually we're going to get a grip on diabetes? Yes, I think so. Fantastic. That's okay. a great place to end. Yeah. Uh, Riaz Malik, thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, there'll be lots more on ESD Live today, so do keep watching. Mm -hmm.